Oh, I love it. When we start the show on a deep track from Fog Hat, that's my kind of way to get going. Happy Monday, everybody, and welcome back to Sports Talk. We've got Adrian Broadus here, Alberto Urueta with us as well. One of you guys leave your phones here. Yes, yeah, so Alberto. I think Zay's on his way as well. We're going to really? have a full house. That's All right. All right. Very nice. When's uh, Cade coming in this week? Uh, I believe Cade's coming tomorrow. And he's got spring break right around the corner as well, so he'll take all of next week off. Uh, And then UTEP football officially kicks off spring football practices. Get this, Steve. March 18th. It's right around the corner. In fact, just two weeks from now. I got a better one for you. Their spring game is going to be on 420. I know. Isn't that hilarious? I love it. Um, April 20th, uh, the day that everybody says it, uh, 420. There you go. Saturday. What if we had like a like an alternate uh, broadcast for the game, like the Manning oh, cast? Oh, no. That'd be and, scary. And we did like the 420 feed on ESP, on 600 ESPN El Paso 2. Oh, my gosh. Broadcasted live from Sunland Park? No, broadcasted live from the Sun Bowl <laughs> uh, like that. But that's the- uh, The alternate feed. Yes, yes. exactly. I kind of like this, Steve. I like where you're going on this. Okay. And, uh, you know, the broadcasters that arrive are- Ready to go for the uh, for the broadcast. Let's put it that way. That's right. They're ready to go. Um, hey, I'm I'm ready for it. I'm ready for spring football practice to get underway just two weeks from today. That's going to be really exciting. And then uh, the spring game. When have you gotten excited about a spring football game? The last couple times it's been more of a spring practice uh, under the previous regime. I don't think I've ever gotten excited about a spring game around here before. This is going to be more interesting than anything else. And uh, we are uh, looking to get confirmation, but the plan is – John Teicher, Cole Freitag, Mondo the Monster, Medina, we're all going to be together to broadcast the spring game on 600 ESPN El Paso starting Saturday at 10 a.m. on April 20th. That's great news. We've done pre-shows beforehand here on Sports Talk um, before the spring games in the past out at the at the Sun Bowl. So the fact that we'll give our listeners uh, an exclusive look at it on the radio feed version, that's going to be really exciting. I mean, there's a lot of new faces, a lot of new uh, players to get acquainted with. Uh, from this new team, so I'm excited for all of that. I am too. I'm excited for the show today. Two hours with you. We'll take you up till 6. Then John Teicher gives us the final regular season edition of UTEP Basketball with Keith Adams and Joe Golding. In fact, uh, John will be live from uh, Hudson's Grill today, 1770 Lee Trevino at the corner of Lee Trevino and Treywood to deliver the last show of the season for UTEP basketball because next week he'll be heading off to Huntsville, Alabama with the men and the women. And before you know it, we'll get started with that. And Adrian, I know a lot of people are excited about uh, tournament time. Uh, the men did something um, over the last two games that they haven't done all year. They won road games. They got off to Schneid, won their first one on uh, Thursday against uh, Jacksonville State. And then on Saturday, played arguably their best game start to finish. Um, unless you count the New Mexico State game here, those are probably the two best games of the season. The only difference is they did it on the road against a team and in a building where nobody does to them what UTEP did. I'm talking about Liberty, who have been practically unbeatable at home. And when they lose, they might lose tight games. They do not get embarrassed. And UTEP started fast. They withstood that 12 nothing run in the second half. They buried Liberty. And they gave fans once again a glimpse into what this team is capable of doing when they put together 40 minutes of basketball. Yeah, and you had the supporting cast members really step up over the two wins. First off on Thursday, it was Derek Hamilton who erupted with the 12 points off the bench. Second half performance by David Terrell off the bench, 11 points on that Thursday game. And then the Saturday game, the story was Corey Camper Jr., yep. his explosion. Uh, he had 21 points. He's It was the Corey Camper Jr. game, no doubt about it, against Liberty. But yeah, they led for the entire game. If you would have had that on your bingo card going into this season, Utah beating Liberty by how much they beat him by and having pretty much almost you know a 15 point advantage all the way through that second half I wouldn't have said that would have been possible especially knowing that they beat the Miners at home I thought it was a bad matchup but it turned out Saturday that UTIP was a bad matchup for Liberty it felt like the Miners could do whatever they wanted with the Flames in that game I never would have expected UTEP to win that game, let alone dominate them the way they did. And again, they played that game like they were at the Haskins Center, and that was what was so impressive. And to be honest, 
Their last two games against the Haskins Center were two losses. So, I mean, maybe let's 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 turn this around. They didn't play that game against Liberty like they were in the Haskins Center. They played that game like they were the team that started the season off 5 and 0. How about that? Maybe that's a better comparison. Right, and and everybody's been pointing out, hey, this year they started off sluggish. Well, wait, they actually started off five and zero. So that was what was pointed out to us over the weekend, and we had to quickly correct somebody on that. That hey, this team was a hot team early on, out of the gate going into this season. It's when they hit adversity on the road that they started to struggle, and then conference came, and UTEP struggled even more in conference play. But to close out the year playing your best basketball, that's all that matters. I mean, March is all that counts right here in college basketball doesn't matter about the regular season doesn't matter about conference play or your conference record when you go to Huntsville Alabama there's only going to be one team who's going to claim an NCAA tournament bid and you know the big mantra right now with UTEP is why not us why can't they go on a run here uh, to close out the season they look like a different team on this road trip once they were able to close out Jacksonville State they came into Liberty with confidence they built an early lead it never waned I mean, they looked like a legitimate team that can absolutely um, win this tournament. Now, are they going to? Who knows? It's completely up in the air. Uh, It's still a long shot, in my opinion. But, again, if this team puts together performances like Saturday over these next three, four games— absolutely they could play themselves into the conference championship no doubt about it yeah it's it's still hard for me to say hey this team can go on a deep run just I need to see it more consistently like we saw it uh, to start off the year five games in a row string along these uh, games you know under your belt if you're UTEP I mean they could go to the conference tournament with a three game winning uh, streak which is obviously positive because they were coming into this road swing last Thursday on a four game losing streak so the resiliency on this team is something that head coach Joe Golding has highlighted, and you see it. I mean, they get punched in the face, everybody counts them out, and they don't quit. I mean, that's something that you could at least respect about this bunch right here. Yeah, there's no, there's no doubt. And and we've been doubting them most of the season because they've been inconsistent and uh, they've been disappointing us. I mean, let's be honest, fans have been disappointed. And I don't blame them. I feel like everybody was. There was a point where Joe Golding and his team, were, were they were facing the heat, and it's not over yet. Fans were talking about how he needs to go and how it's t- the, the, the experiment has failed and it's just he can't recruit, he can't do this, he can't do that. And now all of a sudden, you saw those performances, especially the Liberty game, and you're starting to say to yourself, huh, well, Liberty might not be the best team in the league, but they're awfully tough at home, and UTEP basically went right in there and just hit him in the mouth and they never let up. So, again, if UTEP is able to go in a neutral site – in Huntsville next week and play like they did on Saturday, they are going to be a very, very tough out. In fact, the key might not necessarily be there. You know, you know, their defense is coming. Their defense is going to show up and more likely than not, they'll cause 20 turnovers. They'll get a zillion steals and they'll, they'll do what they've done all year long. But if that offense could put it together and the offense can do what they did on Saturday, Adrian, which is step up. Remember in that game, You didn't need much from Tay Hardy. Tay Hardy was really not a factor offensively in that one because you had guys, like you mentioned earlier, with Corey Camper Jr., and you had guys, um, you know, like Zid Powell, who also played well in that one. And then you think about, um, you know, some of the other guys that have been delivering for you uh, this season. There's one guy in particular who's coming back next year that has looked better and better. Every single game. And some are going to say, oh, it's got to be David Terrell Jr. Because all he does is win Conference USA Player of the Week awards. And there's no doubt about that. I like, I think that, you know, that's one of the more exciting guys coming up in this team. But I'm not talking about David Terrell Jr. Even though I think the future is extremely bright with what he is going to be able to do. No, I am talking about somebody who, again, has been a leader this season, but he's never really been asked to carry the team on his back. All he does is go out game after game after game and produce. He might not lead the team, but he shows up. That's Otis Frazier the third. 
Yeah, and somebody who was counted out at his previous stop at George Mason, right? I mean, he averaged under two points a game when he was there for his first two seasons. And I'm looking at him now and I'm thinking, what did they see or not see in him that UTEP's really tapping into? Because he is just a big contributor. Uh, today, Joe Golding was saying they don't even run plays for him. He just he picks his spots. He finds his ways. He's a, a great cutter uh, is per uh, Joe Golding in terms of his offense. And he's their leader in these games, even in that uh, win against Liberty. I thought he was really effective in that one. 11 points. I thought he should have been recognized this week as Conference USA Player of the Week. Uh, they chose a FIU player this week. Conference USA did. And uh, Otis Frazier third. he's playing his way into a all-conference-like finish and recognition in this league. He's a fantastic defender, and then now he's starting to do it on the offensive side too. Yeah, it's true, and it's making you wonder if, uh, again, this team continues to do what they've done over the weekend – Sky's the limit, that's for sure. Uh, women weren't as lucky, unfortunately, against Liberty on Saturday. Uh, Liberty spoiled the women's senior day. It was close at half, but third quarter kind of doomed them. And then uh, in the fourth, the Miners just uh, they, they, they could not come back and, and make it an interesting game. So unfortunately for UTEP, they lost on senior day. Um, Alberto was there. He was uh, handling uh, the uh, sideline interviews for the UTEP ladies. And uh, Alberto... Um, again, for this UTEP women's team, much like the men, at times uh, they'll look good against uh, the equal or uh, you know a competition that's maybe not necessarily top of the league. But we've seen when the best teams come in here, they've given UTEP some trouble, and the Miners just don't really have what it takes to get over the hump against the elite in Conference USA. Yeah, they they definitely don't. And you know what it was this last time is, and you said it after the game was the height. You know the Miners were just not not tall enough to really compete with this Liberty team, or that's what it felt like. Their tallest player is 6'6". That's Bella Smoot at 6'6". She was easily um, just out, uh, out um, just had outbodying Jaina Sinde, yeah. and even um, smaller players than her, which was uh, girls like Bailey Jordan, girls like Elizabeth, and I'm going to say this wrong, is I got daughter. That's, or that's how it said on the on the um, pronunciation guide. Um, they were just all bigger than her, than, than Jaina Sinde, and that's your top reorder. You can't get boards. You can't do much. Uh, Asia, boom, then goes off, hits six from deep, had a career-high 25 points. It was difficult for the Miners they pull, as uh, Liberty pulls away in the fourth, and they just don't have enough. No, it's true. And right now, when the women uh, going into their final game of the season where they're going to be on the road against uh, FIU, UTEP kind of finds themselves in a precarious position they're in a three-way tie for fifth place right now. And Florida International, believe it or not, is 10-4 and four this season. And uh, they are 12-5 and five at home. So they have been a, a two-seed right now, the way this is going to go. So it's not going to be easy for uh, Keith Adams and company to go into Miami and try to knock off the Panthers to wrap up CUSA play. No, and, 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 you know, even if, if the Miners uh, happen to go in there, give the Panthers everything they got, you still have to face a Middle Tennessee team after that that's uh, undefeated in conference play. They have some phenomenal players, and so that's not going to be easy. That, that's another extremely hard task. You know, Middle Tennessee's got great players in, in that Savannah Wheeler, uh, Anastasia Buldareva, she's a phenomenal player. She gets in the paint and does a lot of damage. So, yeah, the Miners have an uphill battle right here, but, you know, a lot of the things that I look at is uh, the great play that some of the younger players have given the, uh, the Miners. You know, girls like Delma Zita, Mariama, Mariama Sal, uh, girls like that, they're, they're still fairly young, and they've given some great performances, and, and they've grown a lot this season, and, and that's what I'm looking forward to. For. As far as the men go, they were in an 8-9 matchup a week ago. Now, they could potentially get as high as 4 if things break their way, which is really unbelievable, but it also goes to show you, Adrian, how much parity is in the middle of this league. Yeah, and I don't think that 4-5 matchup is that favorable because as it stands right now, it probably is going to be Middle Tennessee unless something crazy happens. And hey, we've seen crazier things happen to close out conference play, so if it's somehow a Liberty 4-5 matchup, that would favor the Miners, and I, I like them in that matchup right there. I think they match up really well against the Flames. Now, if it ends up being Middle Tennessee, 
if it's somehow the 4-5 matchup, that'd be a tough uh, battle for the Miners. I would say this, as it stands right now, I'd be surprised if they're not the 6th seed. Um, it looks like all signs are pointing to them being that 6th seed. It's just a matter of who, the, who are they going to play. Is it going to be Western Kentucky when it's all said and done? Maybe even Middle Tennessee finds their way into that 3 seed if they could sneak their way into it by winning some games this weekend? Or Liberty, uh, that would be a pretty big upset as well. Yeah, I mean, again, I don't know. Western Kentucky has a two-game lead on Liberty and Middle Tennessee. With uh, For them, uh, it's going to be one to play for Western Kentucky, but uh, Liberty and Middle both have two to play. So, yeah, it is going to be interesting to see how the chips fall. It seems like Western Kentucky has the inside track to the three, but they're going to have a very difficult final game of the uh, of their regular season. I'll tell you who does not care. Uh, UTEP does not care who they play. They uh, We asked them today about standings, if they've been looking at it. I've been asking this, feel like a pest about this, but I've been asking about this a couple weeks now, and they're not looking to avoid any games like last week, avoiding the 8-9 matchup. They're not looking to try to you know gain a game or, or get up in the standings right now. Uh, Joe Golding said he's not really looking at the standings, and he's just uh, focused on what's at hand, and that's FIU. Love it. Uh, again, we got a lot to cover on the show today. It's going to be a busy one for us, so we want to talk to you. 505 6009. We got awards to give out. We got two hours with you here on a Monday edition of Sports Talk. With all that, let's get right to Charlie One. He's back with our first traffic update of our afternoon commute. Twenty-two past the hour as we continue here on Sports Talk five zero five six zero zero nine. That is our telephone number five zero five six zero zero nine. Gets you right on in and through to the program. Would love to hear from you. Anything on your mind? Now is the time to talk. How do you feel? I mean, I heard uh, minor talk. You had some calls, a lot of uh, comments on social as always, and you know fans feel better about this team than they did a week ago, Adrian, but it's so difficult for fans to just jump right back on board. It's almost like you say to yourself, okay, great. Two great performances, close out strong. Let's go into next week in Huntsville. And hey, if this team can start to uh, you know, play like that, game in, game out, all of a sudden you've got uh, a different mindset. You know, one of the things that I keep forgetting as well, Steve, is that I think the fans are, they have something brewing against Liberty right now. Fans don't like Liberty. And so the fact that UTEP defeated the Flames the way that they did, I think that meant something to the people here. Like they referenced. Reference the mariachi, uh, the mariachis who came here at the Sun Bowl as the football team defeated UTEP here, uh, you know, a couple months ago, not too long ago, and then also they were talking about how when the basketball team, the men's side, when they were here, they didn't like them either. They thought they were pretty pesky and annoying. So it was funny to hear from the fans. Some of them were even saying, "Hey, this is this the new BYU right now? Liberty has kind of turned into uh, that for some of the fans who remember BYU, the Cougars, when they used to play." the miners in the great uh, 80s and 90s. Yeah, that's true. I mean, just trust me when I tell you that BYU, UTEP always was was up for them. That was that was their rival. And maybe Liberty has tried to establish that because Liberty does come across as they're better than you and they're going to show you why with their multi-million dollar budget to pay for coaches and everything else about them and how they win. And that's just what they've been used to. So I could see how Liberty feels almost like they're walking into a league and they automatically feel that they're better than everybody else. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I could see that completely. And I think fans are really embracing this rival role uh, for Liberty and the Flames right now. They've really appreciated uh, just kind of this uh, back and forth between the two teams. And now UTEP has some some weight in this uh, argument right here. A little rivalry, I should say. They won a game. You can't necessarily call it a rival unless you actually win a game in the series. So there you go. There's, uh, there's at least a little step in the right direction for UTEP in this series. I like it. I like where you're going with that. And as far as I'm concerned, good. That's the way it should be, right? I mean, it's what you want. So um, I have no problem with that. In fact, I thought that uh, 
the way Liberty was able to celebrate after beating UTEP here in the Sun Bowl, it did leave a bad taste in a lot of the, you know a lot of fans' mouths. And maybe that's something that uh, their new head coach uh, is going to incorporate also with his team is they play at Liberty this year, and maybe UTEP would not love nothing, love nothing more than to go in there and uh, and beat them. Yeah, it's a good mentality right there for the upcoming team to have on the football side. So I, I like the fact that basketball, uh, you kind of see the rivalry carry over the fan bases. At least UTEP side, they don't really like Liberty at all. Uh, by the way, I will commend the broadcasters. I thought they were fair on both sides. I like the ESPN Plus broadcast in addition to ours, of course. Uh, but this time around, really enjoyed uh, the road coverage on the Miners, hearing it from uh, the Liberty side as well. I, I did too, and uh, thought they, they did fine. In fact, uh, like you mentioned, Adrian, um, they give you a good perspective on things, and that's that's all you can ask for at this point. So we'll see, folks. We will see now that uh, we... You know, we, we, we have a UTEP team that all of a sudden, again, are they making fans believe? No. But I'll tell you, they played well. They gave they, they did everything they had to. It was a terrific performance. It's the kind of performance fans have been waiting for all season long. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and really, I mean, the last time the UTEP's actually won back-to-back road games has actually been two calendar years from uh, from where we are right now. So it, it reflects back to the team that had Sule Boom, Jamal Biennemi, Keontae Kennedy, year one for Joe Golding. So for them to sweep the weekend, do it the way that they did, beat Jacksonville State, and Liberty. I think the Liberty game was their most complete game of the season like Joe Golding was talking about today before practice because they they did it on the road. They did it after a win on the road as well. So I didn't actually think that they would beat the Flames in this one. I was just happy that they got a, finally got over the hump and got a road win at Jacksonville State, but to do it against Liberty on the road, I think that's impressive. That's something to celebrate for sure and you know, uh, is if they're playing their best basketball, it's be, it's good that it's happening right here as the season's winding down. 505-6009. That is our telephone number as we continue here on Sports Talk. 505-6009. Is UTEP Zay in the house? He is. He is in the house. This is uh, long-awaited UTEP Zay re- returning to the studios. This is UTEP spring break, Zay? Yes. This really? Is, yes. Finally on spring break. All right, Zay. We haven't heard from you in a thousand years. You've been busy. You've got track. You've got life. You've got school. Now you have you have a break for a couple of weeks. You tell me. Give me your takeaways for what you had a chance to see on UTEP basketball this past weekend. Yeah, I agree. I think this was probably their most you know complete performance. It was on the road. It was you know one of the tougher environments in conference USA. I think I'm I'm comfortable saying that at Liberty, and um, they just looked great all around. Their their defense really forced Liberty to be you know kind of jumpy offensively, and you know on the other side of the ball they were they were getting you know anything they wanted inside. They took advantage of that size adva- uh, size disadvantage. They did. Um, do you feel like uh, that is the best performance you've seen since the first five games of the season? Yeah, easily. I, I think you know a lot of fans will agree with that. I mean, they just looked really good. It was really satisfying watching them play like that. It was. And it kind of makes you wonder if this could be the start of maybe this team rekindling that early season success, right? Yeah, it could be. It could be. And, you know, if you're a fan, obviously you hope it is. But, you know, you can't get ahead of yourselves, right? You got FIU on Thursday. If you look ahead of, you know, if you look over them, you think, hey, that's an easy win, senior night. And and you somehow drop that game at home. I mean, all that momentum is halted. That's true. That is true. You got you to make it happen, and you got to deliver, which is what fans want to see right now. All right, we're hitting the bottom of the hour on Sports Talk. We've got Zay. We have Alberto. We have Adrian. Um, we've got a lot. We've got a lot in store for you over the next 90 minutes. We also have lines open, 505-6009. You tell me, folks, after watching the Miners' performance against Jacksonville State and Liberty, do you have a change in outlook do you feel like this team can win some games in the tournament or even go farther than that? Or are you still not sold until you see uh, really what will happen next week? We'd love to get your thoughts on it. 505-6009. You can also get in on the program at 600 ESPN El Paso on Twitter and X. As we send it over to Adrian, let's get this bottom of the hour Sports Center update. Adrian, thank you very much. All right, 32 now past the hour as we continue. 
888-729-6009. Awards were given out after the game uh, on uh, Saturday on Minor Talk. All right, let's get started with our win supply El Paso hot hand of the game. You had a few to choose from here, so who'd you take? This one it goes to Zid Powell. Uh, he do he did what he does best, and that's control the game in the second half. 19 points, 7 for 9 from the field, and the stat that we like the most, zero turnovers for Zid Powell in 23 minutes of action. Uh, helped the Miners immensely and also was a threat at the charity stripe. Zid Powell winning the hot hand award from this past week. Weekend. I thought you could make an argument that this was actually Zid's best game since the Wyoming game in the West Star Don Haskins Sumble Invitation. Yeah, and to be fair, you know, he's had his share of struggles throughout conference play and non conference. He really came out of his shell and really came onto the scene nicely for this team. The UC Santa Barbara game, that was one that you could be excited about. And of course, like you mentioned, the Wyoming game. So you'd probably have to look all the way back until that one, the final of the West Star Don Haskins Sunbowl Invitational, when he put up 32 points against the Cowboys. You know what I saw about Zid? did yesterday or Saturday that I really liked a lot. And this is just interesting. I noticed this though, when he shoots a jump shot and the ball is not like a line drive, but has a little more arc in his shot. You could tell that it's got a much better chance to go in. And I felt like on Saturday, that was Zid Powell. The ball had more arc to it. It wasn't as much of a, of a low uh, line drive. And you know, again, he's the kind of guy that, when he is able to click offensively and and like you said play turnover free basketball that is part of you know that's that's when utep is at their best yeah, no doubt about it. And for Zid as well, I mean, he's never particularly shot the three-point uh, well, uh, but this year you've seen him really improve on his two-point game. So I like when he drives in for layups. I like when he draws contact. That's when he's at his best. So uh, at the, when he's at his best playing like that, he no, um, no question about it is the hot hand of the game and also could be player of the game. That's the kind of level he's playing at when he does that. Speaking of hot, weather's starting to heat up. Went outside in shorts and a t-shirt yesterday. Felt good. I mean, that means the heat is coming, which also means it's time to start thinking about keeping your house cool. It's been cool all winter. Got to keep it cool now in the spring and the summer months. Here is what you do. You go to the Find a Dealer tab at windsupplyelpaso.com and click on Champion Dealers. It'll take you to the Certified Champion Elite Dealers. There's three of those. And the Preferred Champion Dealers, and we have another 10 of those. And what you'll do is you'll find a dealer nearest you, tell them you heard about Champion on Sports Talk with Wind Supply El Paso, and you want them to make sure they can come by your house and give you the best possible deal on Champion Heating and Cooling. All right, now time for our Player of the game brought to you by Timothy Cantrell. Yeah, this one, no question about it. Corey Camper Jr. It was his game, uh, twenty-one points, career high in the division at the Division One level. He's actually put up a forty-point game at the JUCO level, which is pretty cool in itself. Had 17 20 plus point performances last year for Tyler Junior College, and this year, this is his first twenty-four uh, twenty-point performance. But Corey Camper Jr. He found a, uh, a mismatch that he really liked, and he just got to all his uh, shots this past weekend so of course he needs to be credited he is the player of the game uh Corey Camper Jr what a what a performance yeah absolutely right absolutely so again congratulations and uh wow Th- he looked more like the guy that was averaging 19 in Juco that's 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 the best way to put it is that's the kind of guy that UTEP really has been recruiting and wanting but again Some of these guys are inconsistent, Adrian. He didn't score against Jacksonville State. Can you imagine going from zero to that performance against Liberty? Yeah, and he's actually had an up-and-down performance uh, throughout these past couple weeks. He's had some games where he stands out. Other games, you forget he's on the floor. But I love that performance against Liberty, just dominant. Uh, You're right. I mean, Jacksonville State, toward the end, he was unplayable. They just Mm -hmm. couldn't throw him out on the floor uh, enough to actually warrant some playing time. And in that game you uh, against Liberty, Liberty, you could not take him off the floor. That's how good he was offensively. A player of the game after every game brought to you by Timothy Cantrell, your trusted real estate agent with over 20 years of experience. You know what Timothy has? He has valuable resources, unwavering dedication, and vast knowledge to make sure your real estate dreams do come true. When you're ready to take the next step, call Timothy today. 915 915- 204-8441. You can call or text him 915-204-8441 or and follow him on Instagram at Timothy Realtor for the latest listings and tips. All right. 
One game left to go for the Miners. Thursday, Haskins Center, Florida International. If they win this game, they're 7-9, and nine, and it sounds crazy, but 7-9 and nine could put you in that 4-5 game. You could stay in the 6 seed. Uh, one thing's for certain, they will not be in the 8-9 game. And Adrian, that's the most important thing because the Miners do not want to have to play that extra game next week in the conference tournament. Sure, and it does need to be said that Florida International, despite having a really tough season, I mean, they closed out the month of January, 7-14 and overall, 2-4 and in conference play. They've turned it around a little bit and played a little bit better as of late, having quality wins against the likes of Sam Houston State. They beat uh, Western Kentucky this past weekend, albeit it was at home. They've got the Borderland, um, you know, road series ahead of them they've got a utep here thursday new mexico state saturday let's see what happens for fiu i i've liked how they played better I, you know they played better close to close out this season jeremy ballard needs to try to turn things around over there at fiu easier said than done that's a tough program uh and so the miners definitely can't take this team lightly they've got to beat them here on thursday 38 now past the hour as we continue on Sports Talk. 505-6009 gets you right through to the program. That's 505-6009. All right, so we're feeling like uh, I think we all feel the same way. Would you say that right now if we had to poll everybody, and I'll start with Alberto because he's right next to me, do you feel different about Utah basketball today than you did last week this time? Um, not really. I, I think it's it's the same team I've been seeing, and I know what they're capable of. So to you, um, you were never down like everybody else was last week or really up today. You've always felt like when they put it together, this this is exactly what you you you, you know you expect. Yeah, when the team uh, puts it together and all, all all sides of the ball are, are, are playing really well, they can beat a decent amount of teams. Unfortunately for the Miners, they just haven't been able to do that consistently. So yeah. that's where I take it. I'm just middle of the road. I'm not on or off. I'm just – I know that when they play together and they play well like a team, they win, but they don't do that often, so they don't win many games in conference. So that's how I see it. Zay. Yeah, you know, I'm kind of with Alberts. I'm in the middle, right? We, we've seen how this team performs when they're together. Obviously, you know, the games like Liberty, Jacksonville State, and even going all the way back to that Cal game, even though this is a completely different team now, right? We know what they're capable of, but we know, you know, if they struggle shooting or, you know, if they're not getting stops defensively consistently, that, you know, games can get out of hand quickly. So, you know, I'm, I'm definitely in the middle as well. All right, Adrian. I would say right now I'm still I'm not as as high on this team as I probably could be coming off two road wins. They're still the team that lost four straight to kind of close down the year. Let's see what they could do and how, what their performance looks like against Florida International. I'll say this: if they want to convince me that mo- momentum's on their side and that they've got the motivation to continue here in Huntsville, then I'll buy into that motivation and momentum uh, that could go into next uh, next week. But I need to see it on Thursday again. Uh, for me to realize that, hey, this wasn't just a weekend thing. Beat FIU and beat them handily. I'll say this, okay? I didn't feel good about this team last week. I felt like they couldn't close and win a game on the road. I felt like mentally they knew it. It was in their heads more than anything else. And all I wanted to see was them finally get a win just to get that belief that they can win on the road. And they got it on Thursday, and then they showed up on Saturday and just beat up a team that most of us thought they had no chance against. On this show Friday, we all pretty much chalked it up as a, as a loss, and we're hoping they would just keep it close, let alone doing what they did. So now, we've seen a roller coaster ride so far. It started up, went down, up, down, mostly, but it's mostly been, you know, that, that inconsistent play. If this team can channel what they've done, these last few games, Thursday into next week, I'm feeling much better about them now than I was a week ago. Let's put it that way. Yeah, that's a fair point because last week we were talking about a losing record, like another yeah. losing season. We were having to go back a couple of years or, you know, five, six years ago to realize the last back to back losing season stretch that UTEP basketball's had. So you're right. They've turned the, the corner in in that light. They're not looking like they're going to have a losing season this year, assuming they beat FIU Friday. Even a loss in the first round of the CUSA tournament wouldn't mean a below 500 season. So for the Miners, I think that's you know an accomplishment to kind of turn things around late in the season and to have more momentum going into the conference tournament. But if this team does not play well in the conference tournament, 
it's a disappointing season. No doubt about it. I mean, this, this, we, we know what they're capable of. So, and this team is capable of going deep and making a, a tournament run that could end up in the championship. That's what they're truly capable of. Some, some schools you're saying, nah, even if they play well, hey, yeah, you're lucky to get a win. Uh, this team, if they play well, they, there's really nobody in this league that you can say right now they can't win against when they're on their game. Yeah, their ceiling is something special, right? And I think that's what we're all alluding to right yep. here. I think everybody's being cautiously optimistic when they talk about UTEP here. And and you're right, at the peak peak of their powers in a stretch in Huntsville, Alabama, where you're on a neutral site, neutral court, and no one's necessarily standing out like last year's Florida Atlantic team or UAB team or Charlotte team or North Texas team. You don't have those teams right yep. now in CUSA. That's why it's wide open here to win the conference tournament. Okay. When we come back, we'll wrap up hour number one of two. We'll read some of those tweets coming in as well. You can get into the program at 600 ESPN El Paso as Sports Talk continues. Ten in front of five as Sports Talk continues. Our next dining deals will be coming up uh, on Friday morning, and I am excited to tell you about Buttersmith. Some of you have been eating there, and you know what uh, it's all about, but it's Buttersmith Kitchen and Pies, folks, and we've got three locations in El Paso and one in Las Cruces. That's right. Whether it's uh, North Mesa here on the west side, North Zaragoza Road on the east side, Hondo Pass Drive in northeast, or even Telshore Boulevard in Las Cruces, Buttersmith Kitchen and Pies, they do it right. Their menu is served up. You can have breakfast, lunch, dinner, happy hour. You better believe it. They've got beer and wine. Great way to enjoy. They brought some pies in last week, and oh, my God, those pies were amazing. Adrian, the key lime, the caramel, pecan, silk supreme, delicious. I love the menu, and we are giving our listeners an opportunity. Are you kidding me? To get $50 to Buttersmith for just $25 Friday morning. Yeah, this is really fantastic news right here. Buttersmith, they're the king of pies, simply put, Steve. You know, the, every kind of celebration, whether it's a holiday, whether it's a catered event, whether it's somebody's birthday, it's best served with a pie from Buttersmith. And my family, they're uh, firm proponents of this. They always get the key lime pie, and they always have it at all the family functions. So, yep. uh, you know, sometimes I'll make the pickup. They'll make the pickup. They make it easy for you. You just call them up. They've also got online ordering features. They make it easy for you to order those pies in advance ahead of the big celebration. But I'll tell you what, breakfasts, oh man, skillets, pancake, French toast. They've got breakfast enchiladas, machaca, huevos rancheros, menudo, omelets. Uh, They have a healthy menu and that's just breakfast. Then they do lunch. They do dinner. Folks, this is fantastic. This is great news. We haven't, you know, you know, this is uh, an opportunity for you to take advantage on dining deals. Again, Friday, 10 a.m. You want more information, just check it out online, 600ESPNElPaso.com. Uh, we need to get, uh, we need to get, if you think about it, um, Mr. Knight in town from the NFL Combine. I want to find out how things worked out for him. I saw his 463 40 yard dash. Um, you know, Adrian, he is somebody that, you know, it's, it's been a while since a UTEP player got an invite to the combine. Um, I'm sure he'll do his own pro day here with UTEP pro day during spring ball and have a chance to showcase himself there too. But you tell me, what are the reports you heard out of Indianapolis regarding night and and the combine. Well, now we're starting to hear things. That's what I'm. Uh, that's what I'm seeing is now we're reading, seeing him on boards, mock drafts, and stuff like that. Where? Teams are saying, "Hey, could he go in the fourth round, mm-hmm. all the way as high as there because of his run stopping abilities? He plays that buck linebacker spot. So any team that plays a three four or even you know a, a four three, uh, really, they would they could definitely use his services. Tyrese Knight. I know he wanted to run under. A four six, uh, but you know what? A four six three is really good for linebackers. It was top ten uh, for his uh, statistical category. Really liked what he did at the vertical and the broad jump over this weekend. Uh, and the measurables, they were there. But now it's starting to seem like he is a top ten, uh, bona fide top ten linebacker going into uh, the April draft. That's huge. If he can get to that spot, uh, that would go very well. And.
And uh, man, you imagine a fourth round pick if we could see that? I'd be as long as he's drafted, I'll right. be happy. But uh, it's good for Tyrese Knight to get that opportunity. Yeah, if he goes four through seventh round, it's good because it's the first UTEP minor drafted since Will Hernandez was picked in the second round of 2018. One hour down, one to go. We'll get more of your thoughts on uh, UTEP plus Russell Wilson officially cut by the Denver Broncos. Where will he end up next and are his starting days in the NFL over? We'll talk about it as we continue. More sports talk right here, 600 ESPN El Paso. All right, start of hour number two. It's our final hour of the show. We've got Alberto Urueta with us. We have UTEP Zay making his. When was the last time Zay showed up on Sports Talk? Let's be honest, Adrian. If we had to try to figure this mm. out, when was the last time he was on the program? It was probably when either you or I were out and he was filling in for somebody. So it's been a while. Yeah, I was going to say, when was the last time you had a wedding that um, you were out at? Yeah, a maybe December party? or something like that. God. Yeah. I mean, Zay, have you been here this year? Um, Yeah. Talk? <laughs> Oh, not on Sports Talk. No, I've been here for a couple shifts. You know, I think a minor talk here. But uh, no, I haven't been here on Sports Talk this year at all. All right. Well, you know what's happening, man? Alberto's like trying to, you know, he's he's taking over your territory, dude. I'm just going to tell you, you know, he's always here because he can be. So, you know, he you, we can't tell him not to come because he's here almost all the time. So while you're out there with your budding track and field uh, opportunities at, at Chape and I, uh, Urueta's over here, and he's uh, he's made that seat of yours pretty comfortable around here. Good. So someone needs to you know fill in for me. We just switch. We we switched. You know, he, he subbed in for me. There you go. I like that. That's the way to do it. Um, meanwhile, I can't. I can never. I'm trying so hard to bait them, and Adrian, I just can't do it. They're too nice. <laughs> they get along with each other. There's there's zero rivalry. It's like they're just. You know they're they're returning compliments to each other. I'm like, oh my god, I'm gonna puke. I know it's everybody here is too nice. I mean, from from top to bottom, everybody here really gets along. That's that's uh, behind the scenes stuff. Yeah, what's the deal with that? Why is everybody so? Why is everybody? Yeah, so we should good have some here? rivals. We have we should have some rivals or something like that. Come on, seriously, I was gonna say the same thing. Give it a little, uh, you know, a little fun. All right. Well, listen, nothing we can do. Hey, uh, 505-6009, our telephone number to get into the program. That's 505-6009. Let's check out Twitter and X and see what people are saying. Enrique Ortiz, UTEP men's basketball, really playing it up. This goes to show you they have a chance to win the Conference USA tourney. Just depends on who shows up. Hashtag sorry I doubted my minors. Look, Enrique, don't be sorry. All right. They haven't given you any reason to get excited up until this weekend. I mean, they played well at home, but they hadn't won a road game. Now they have. And the scary thing is, is that once again, they won in a place that most teams don't win. I kept listening to the broadcast that it's been forever since the team went in and did to Liberty what UTEP did. It doesn't happen. Yeah, I mean, the last time that somebody beat them by uh, this margin right there, you have to look at 2019 Lipscomb beat Liberty at home by 20 points. And so what UTEP did was uh, a pretty big thing. I mean, it doesn't happen uh, when Liberty hosts a lot of home games. Uh, they don't lose a lot of home games whatsoever. So Miners fa- found a mismatch that they really liked all game long offensively, and they took advantage of it. And to their credit, I mean, they sweep the weekend. It was their best weekend, arguably, of conversation conference play even at home you know you look, reflect at some of their home wins throughout the season I don't know if you could stack two road wins against uh, their uh, you know a home sweep like they've had this season uh, and like what we saw this past weekend I thought you saw a full game against Liberty in that Saturday matchup and that's why fans feel a bit better about this team right now no you're right you're absolutely right we gave out our awards last hour we talked about it I feel like we're all pretty much in the same mind frame right now where you know what we don't feel confident about next week, but we also don't necessarily think that they're going to be a, an, you know, a, just a quick out. I feel like everybody feels like this team will show up. The only question is, can they play like they played Saturday all week? Because that is so tough to do. I mean, they're capable of it, but we've just seen different versions of each player and, and, and different versions of this team this year, and you just kind of wonder – Will we be able to get the version that can actually punch their ticket to the dance, 
or will we get the version that will have fans shaking their head going, man, what a waste of what could have been a really good season? Yeah, and, and they're going through it right now, right? I mean, you know, Tay Hardy's playing through something right now that's going on behind uh, closed doors. Uh, he's got some kind of shoulder, you know, injury. He's playing through it. There's, I, could, I can't necessarily call it an injury if you play the full duration of the game. But you see it when he tries to uh, perform the same way offensively. If you have your leading scorer playing that way, you're going to need big performances from your supporting cast members like Otis Frazier III, like Corey Camper Jr., Derek Hamilton, or, or whomever it might be. I mean, that's what's really important about this team. They need performances. They need help and boost from their supporting cast members. It can't just be uh, your starters giving it to you every single game. No, you're right. Um, again, 505-6009, our telephone number. You mentioned that uh, UTEP is going to be on spring break here, and then they'll be coming back uh, in a couple of weeks for the start of spring ball. UTEP Zay, how you've been like on the UTEP Scotty Walden hype train ever since the video started dropping with recruiting and everything else, and I know you're fully on board. How excited are you with what will be arriving here uh, in just a few weeks with his first spring uh, spring camp? Oh, man, I'm really excited. I mean, they have a lot of momentum, you know, just from recruiting alone, right? They, they, they've won over a lot of fans, and, you know, it's just exciting to see this team, what it's going to look like, you know, what – what type of, you know, who's going to be playing, really? You know, this is our first look at, you know, the freshmen, the transfers, everything. You know, this is almost a whole new team that we're going to see, and I, I can't be more excited. You know what I'm excited about? And I'm not going to lie to you guys. I want to see that quarterback room when they start and get a really good idea if we think that our own Cade McConnell is is going to emerge and stay the starting quarterback this season. I I want to see what's I want to see who's coming in. I already know about Jake McNamara and um I also uh, already know uh, about um about Kevin Hurley. I don't know about the players he's bringing in. Pickles, JP Pickles and then the uh, redshirt sophomore who is coming in right, Skylar Locklear from uh, Austin P. I'm super interested in those two to see what kind of serious competition at the quarterback spot Cade's going to have this year. Yeah, because uh, this offense is all predicated on the quarterback, the production from the quarterback. I mean, they call plays at lightning speed, so the quarterback has to have high IQ, has to deliver plays very quick to his offense, and has to be prepared for high intensity, uh, high offense, and how high powered uh, you know approach. So I think they're going going to need to try to narrow down that quarterback room in spring ball. So I think that's a really important thing for them because in the fu- in the summer, you want to go in knowing who kind of your yep. guys are, who's going to be leading the charge for you offensively. That way, when fall camp comes around, you're just fine-tuning things ahead of the season actually kicking off. And these QBs need to be 100% healthy. I mean, they all do because they're getting, all, they're getting a clean, fresh start and a chance to impress the new coaching staff. And that's really the first time they'll have a chance to do it during all these spring practices leading up to the spring game. Yeah, and I also want to see some of the returning players, how they mix with some of these newcomers. I mean, Austin P. it feels like all the standouts from their team uh, joined Scotty Walden and the coaching staff over here at UTEP. Mm-hmm. How do those guys fit in with the returning players? Defensively, we can already talk about Maurice Westmoreland. He's going to be their premier uh, pass rusher on this team, probably their best all-around defensive player on this team coming back. And same with AJ Odoms, the cornerback who transferred two seasons ago from New Mexico, uh, made an impact this past year as a starting cornerback and is uh, coming back for his final season next year under uh, head coach Scotty Walden. Again, 505-6009 if you want to get into the program as we continue. Esteban getting in on the show. Steve, you mean rivalries like you and Wit when you first started out? Again, this is a step on trying to be cute. He won't even call Buzz Adams by his real radio name. <laughs> he wants to use his actual last name. Now, you got to understand something. There was never a rivalry with me and with Buzz. Buzz was the boss. I knew that from the very beginning. He was the boss. There was never that rivalry. I came on that show doing sports. I did crazy things to make a name for myself at the time because I was 22 years old out of college. So, yeah, 
I would go downtown and interview people at, uh, that, that were homeless in the plaza at that time in the mid-90s. That was something we did. Would I jump out of moving vehicles covered in cash for people to grab money during the Christmas time? Absolutely. Would I dress up in Elmo in an Elmo costume and be a part of uh, a toy drive that turned into an armored hard, uh, hijacking? Yes, I did. But that was part of the job back in the That was the job responsibilities. Never a rivalry. <laughs> Come Never on, a rivalry. Come on, man. That is see Esteban's trying to, he's trying to troll and start up. Yes. I mean, come on, man. He he actually is becoming uh, one of our top trolls. We used to have Augustine be a troll, but I think, you know what, we've out-trolled Augustine uh, because of the bottle of tequila that will never come, because of the yeah. phantom uh, basketball career in Mexico. So True. now I think uh, Esteban's taken over. I think so, too. And by the way, I'm just happy Esteban listened in those days. At least he was listening to that show. And loyal listener. That's 30 years ago. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the fact that he was tuning in all those years ago. I mean, you know, listen, that was my start. And I will always be grateful, always, to Buzz for giving me an opportunity to get started on that program many, many years ago. And uh, I, always, I always knew what my end game was. This was my end game. I was like, you know what? John's hosting the show. That's no problem. But eventually, wanted to make a name for myself on that station. And my foot into the door at the time was was that morning show. So rivalries, nah. Too many good people. That's why I still like this is why I like to go on there right now. It's still a lot of fun. Yeah, come on, Esteban. I mean, he, he might be bringing this up because uh, he likes your appearances weekly on the Buzz Adams Morning Show. Well, they're good. They're entertaining. I mean, I right. hope, I'm hoping he likes that. It's kind of like you on Kiss with uh, with Iris. It's definitely, exactly. Aren't you on tomorrow morning? Uh, sometimes. I don't know if I'm going to be on tomorrow morning. So it's every uh, every Tuesday, we'll hit them up and see what they have on their schedule. I'll tell you what, I will be on tomorrow morning. I'm going to be popping in in the 9 o'clock hour, so you'll be able to catch me tomorrow. So I'm looking forward to that. All right. Anyway. Uh, rivalries are good, though. There's nothing wrong with it. You know what? Ri- you know what a good. Think, you know what I love about sports rivalries. What I like about that is, it just is extra motivation. It's more motivation for fans. It's more motivation for players. There's nothing wrong with rivalries. They're good. All it's going to do is drive you to be better at what you do. We've had rivalries on this radio station over the years, and not necessarily people that all work within this building, but maybe there's a competing station you have developed a rivalry with. You wanted to beat them in the ratings and all that. There's, that's, 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 hey, that's good. Competition is healthy. Competition is good. Always feel. If there's no competition, it gets kind of stale after a while. You get bored. You want, you want to make sure that you've always got something, a reason to keep yourself going. Yeah, and to uh, just bring it back to UTEP, I mean, no one liked the makeshift or fabricated rivalries. I mean, people would always debate, is UTEP Rice a rivalry? Is UTEP North Texas a rivalry? UTSA? I mean, those felt like, you know, forced at times. Maybe yep. sometimes, uh, you know, those sides had a bit of animosity against each other. Uh, but UTEP Liberty, to to go, ba- uh, go back to this rivalry that's kind of brewing right now and starting, I like it. I like it from both sides. Well, you got to feel like right now, if you had to look at UTEP, and I'll get your thoughts on this, guys. We gotta get to a break. So, so think about this during the break, okay? The whole league has changed. We already know New Mexico State's a built-in rivalry from all the years they've been non-conference rivals. But is Liberty going to be, as Adrian mentioned, that next BYU type rivalry for UTEP and UTEP fans? So that's something I want you to think about as we head to the break at five zero five six zero zero nine or on the social at six hundred ESPN El Paso. We'll talk more about that. I mentioned Russell Wilson. We'll get to that conversation. John Teicher. A lot more in store as we head over to Charlie One. Let's get another traffic update. Back here on Sports Talk as we continue. All right. 20 past the hour right now. 40 minutes till we get you ready for UTEP basketball with Kevin Baker and Joe Golding. That's all coming up here. I'm sorry. What did I say? Kevin, Kevin Baker? Baker? Oh, my good. God. That's it's pathetic. It's all good, man. Keith Adams and Joe Golden. My I've let it slip. No, uh, it's path- that should not happen. Anyway, that's all coming up here in 40 minutes on 600 ESPN El Paso. Looking at some of the messages coming in on the app. At the fights Friday, you guys were uh, boys' night out, and we were on date night at the fights. Um, I'll explain what that means here in a moment. And then Pinky went on to say, you're stealing my thunder. I tweeted Saturday, Liberty is the new BYU, and Zid has been missing since the Wyoming game. Sheesh. And um, let's uh, let's just start with a bunch of these things. Fights were great uh, Friday night. Um, I was out there 
so was uh, Alberto. The uh, It was a late night. I mean, they took their second intermission at like 10.30. Oh, and there were two me. fights to go. And I've got with me two 11-year-olds. And I'm like, oh, there's just, there, there's no way. So we we left, missed the Jorge Tovar and Stephanie Hahn uh, fights, which I was very disappointed on because that's why we came. And I didn't even get home until 11, and that was before the last two fights even happened. If, if we were there, we wouldn't have been home until midnight. Man, late night, Steve. Late night for fights. Uh, were the fights that you saw pretty high quality? Because yes. I heard good things about it. Excellent. Excellent. How was the crowd? Strong. They had a good crowd on uh, Friday. What do you think, Alberto? Yeah, it was it was a good crowd, and you know what? Also, the crowd was engaged. They, they were paying attention to the fights, and when they were told that the fights were going to be paused for this, that, or the other, they didn't like that. They wanted to see more action. So, yeah, I think it was a, it was a great event. When the two the two fights that I saw, I really enjoyed. Biggest controversy of the night was when they made all the fans pour beer out of their beer cans and put them in a cup. Oh wow! Okay. So okay. this is interesting. The um, the Coliseum was selling beer, right? And they were selling beer in their beer cans. They were like 24-ounce cans. They were huge. And then all of a sudden, they, like in the middle of that, announce that everybody who has a can of beer needs to pour it in a plastic cup. Did you have a plastic cup around you? No, but I had a beer that was staying cold. I was getting upset. Man, that's a lot to ask for people. By the way, I want to thank... uh, Eric from Expert HVAC and Refrigeration for taking care of the beer for me on uh, on Friday night. That was very nice. Bought me a beer. And I was really enjoying it. And then all of a sudden, I poured it in a plastic cup, and it warmed up real fast. Like, it was it was that perfect chill, um, you know, as I was drinking it. And then within five minutes of going in the plastic cup, the beer started getting warm. Maybe a sales tactic to get you to get more, Steve? You know, no warm beer. You got to get some uh, colder ones. I don't know. You know what they're afraid of? They're afraid that fans are going to throw beer in the ring. Oh, that's now, scary. Yeah, there okay. is there is a precedent about this, okay? I don't know how many of you are listening remember this, but 26 years ago, maybe, 27 years ago, they held a Tuesday night fight at the Coliseum. It was either Tuesday or Saturday. Now I'm forgetting if it was an HBO show on a Saturday night or if it was a USA Tuesday night fight, because in the in the '90s they were always they were at the Coliseum quite a bit. Okay, HBO was there with Lampley and that whole crew, and the Tuesday night fight series, which I think had either Steve or Al Albert hosting it, they were there because I was at both. One of those nights, there was a controversial decision, and they took the fight away from a guy from one of the fighters from Mexico. And the fans reacted at the Coliseum by throwing beer into the ring. It was raining beer for minutes, and they and it was brutal. Like, they had to stop everything. They had to tell the fans not to. And when they told the fans not to do it, more started coming down. And I always felt like, since that night, they've always been afraid of fans and beer cans at the Coliseum. And this is 20-something years ago. That's a wild story. I had no clue about this one. Trying to do some Google search, uh, searches of this one. Oh, you're one. not going to find it. Yeah, this. I was going to say, this one's probably buried Listen, in the archives here. If anybody was around, just, I don't remember, it, maybe a step on notes, because he's old and doesn't forget things, obviously. I could tell by that. Um, it was either It was either a Tuesday night fight card, which, by the way, the Tuesday night fight card, listen to this, Sugar Shane Mosley, and a young up and coming newcomer named Floyd Mayweather. Wow, that's so cool. Man. It was like his third or fourth professional fight was at the Coliseum that night. No way. That's a great story right there. I know Mayweather pretty much cut his teeth uh, by, you know, having a couple fights here going through El Paso, but the fact that it was one of his earliest fights of his career, that's yep. pretty special. You have no idea how incredible El Paso was as a fight town in the nineties. They were getting fights all the time, all the time. And I mean big ones, televised ones. Whether it was HBO, USA, ESPN, 
They were fighting here on a regular basis, and the biggest names in boxing outside of Tyson, they all fought here. Chavez Sr., Chavez Jr., Mayweather, um, Vargas. I talked about Mosley, Barrera, um, you know, just you name it. They were all here. Eric Morales. It was amazing. Like, this was a who's who of boxing. And this was, I can't even explain it because, of course, De La Hoya fought here in 98. But before and after Oscar was here, there were fights two, three times a year in El Paso, and they were always big names and big promoters. So Aaron was here a ton with top rank. I think Don King came here at times. I mean, this was just a a, a popular, popular venue. So I went to the fights all the time covering uh, those for this radio station. And, I mean, we saw some of the best fighters ever to come out of the ring all in El Paso. Do you think that's why fans, like to Alberto's earlier point about how fans were really excited and uh, they were there and active the whole night, do you think just kind of the reflections or your, the, the thoughts of yesteryear kind of ring true to all the combat sports fans here because of that? It's a fight town. I mean, this is a, this is a legitimate fight town. However, that being said, because some El Pasoans were spoiled – because it was the best of the best, it's tougher now when you don't bring stacked cards here like you used to. Now, let's just say this. We have good pro fighters in El Paso. We really do. Stephanie Holland could easily be fighting for a world title in the next couple of years. I love Victor Aranda. He is a guy that I think is on the rise and has an incredible future in front of him. We mentioned Tovar earlier. There are good pro fighters coming out of this town. So I love the fact that they are getting an opportunity to showcase their skills. But El Paso also deserves an opportunity to get another televised event with big names on the card like they did years ago. This city has shown that they'll spend good money if they're getting good top-of-the-line fighters. It's a fight town. But when you're at when you're charging a lot of money and you're not putting together a great card of fights, um, it's tougher that way. You're asking El Pasoans to shell out, and they're sophisticated. They're not just going to come for boxing. They want to come to see a good quality product. Yeah, and to your point, I mean, those are the opportunities. Unfortunately, El Paso's had, as of late, over the last 10 years, you'll see some of those, you know, Fox Sports uh, cards that'll come by or, or whatever, uh, and they'll stop by, and, and they'll draw okay here in El Paso, but the boxing aficionados, they want to spend their money where they see the stars come by, or at least yeah. one or two big names come by. So I hope, whether it's a sport of boxing, a sport of MMA, I hope we get more for the combat sports lovers here in El Paso. I do, too. It would be awesome if we one day get a UFC event in El Paso, like a legit UFC pay-per-view. That would be fantastic, and I hope that eventually shows up here in town. No doubt about it. I think there's the market for it here. I think boxing, there's still the market for that. I mean, even Lucha Libre, you see those uh, different house shows that are put on week in, uh, week in and week out. People go to those in a big way. They they always support these different sports that happen here in El Paso. They had a packed house for AEW uh, last February when they brought the Wednesday televised show to El Paso. That was a big deal. If WWE ever comes back with a Raw, a SmackDown, or God forbid, a pay-per-view, they will have this this place packed in in no time. So yes, this city will pay good money for big time events. You just have to deliver those. But that being said, it was a completely local card on Friday night and it was a good crowd, strong crowd. Very impressed with who turned out to see the uh, the boxing with the uh, you know, Kings uh, I think it was the Kings Promotions and uh, it was called um Fight Wars 9. And that was what was happening. I was at, that was at Ring Wars 9. Ring Wars 9 out at the Coliseum. So that was big. All right. You enjoy the event? Yeah, I had a great time. I, I like both the fights that I watched. Um, How was your significant other? Did she have fun? My friend, yeah, she, she enjoyed it. I mean, the two fights we saw, like the first one was good. She, the girl got knocked out in a minute. And the second yeah. one, um, um, the, the, the fight when the dis- went the distance, Amy mm-hmm. Salinas, you know, she was local. The crowd wanted her to win, and, and she didn't. And that girl from San Diego gave her a run for her money. So, yeah, I mean, the two fights I saw, they were great. Okay. And your friend liked it? Yeah. I mean, that first fight was kind of 
kind of made it all worth it with that. It was kind of a, a, a exciting, you know. You took a care of her. You showed up. You had the. Uh, I mean, we, you, you had the potato chips yeah. with the uh, Valentina sauce on it. No one can complain. That was good. Man, snack of choice. I love it. He did. He arrived and they were and they were like both sitting down eating and they were just going to town on those chips and I was just like, man, that's man. A, that's the way to do it. Papas locas, right? Papas yeah, love it. locas. That's right. That's very true. Um, all right, bottom of the hour. More in a moment as we continue. But first, let's get one last Sports Center update. Here's Adrian back with the latest. What a sports Saturday coming up here in El Paso. Locomotive FC, UTEP Beach Volleyball, UTEP Soccer, UTEP Softball, and Monster Jam. My God, that's a lot going on. That's busy. Busy, busy. All right. 33 passed as we continue. Let's go to Cruz. Uh, He's joining us. Cruz, what's happening? How are you? I'm doing okay. How about yourself, bud? Fine, thanks, Cruz. Yep, doing good. Yeah, just a quick comment about Emeril, Ohio. I live there in Emeril, and uh, they're overachievers. Very often they they upset teams that are ranked higher and, you know, better than they are. Um, And they used to do it either in football and in basketball. And I I wanted to mention something about boxing. I was boxing back in the late 70s, and so um, we used to be a, a... somebody to be reckoned with here in El Paso in boxing. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a shame. It's kind of, uh, we're not as strong as we used to, used to be, but I remember we had some very good boxers back in the seventies. And uh, when I was boxing, I was once uh, driving by over here. Uh, what is the bike count just before you hit airways? Yeah. And, uh, that, that park by Burgess, I saw Jimmy Young jogging through there. I turned around. I came back. I parked the car, waited for him to go around the park, and came out to greet him. Uh, to this day, I appreciate it. He stopped jogging, and he shook hands with me and talked a few minutes, shook hands again, and took off, man. Uh, he's a pretty nice guy. I really appreciate it. That I, was, I had just started boxing. Man. Nice. And um, well, I, I met Jimmy Young back there at that, uh, at that park right there. That's awesome. You know, a little bit later, we had Fernie Morales uh, in the early to mid-'80s. We had Cliff Magic Thomas in the kickboxing world. I mean, oh, yeah. We've had, we've had great ones around here. And then, of course, you know, you start going a little bit later, and you start uh, realizing that, uh, you know, we, we've uh, – boxing, we have. We've been very, very fortunate over the years to have uh, some uh, some terrific fighters. And, um, you know, it's it's part of the fun. Ernie Lescano. Uh, we've, we've got, uh, you know – Tony Escalante, David Rodriguez. It's been, uh, of course, Jennifer Hahn, yeah, Ju- A.B. Hahn, now yeah, Stephanie Junior, Hahn. It's awesome. Yeah, Junior Vicencio. Yep. And, well, you know, something about uh, Cliff Magic Thomas, I used to pick him up and give him rides a lot. He went to Bel Air High School. He used to sit down, and we used to talk for lunch. Mm. I used to give him a ride. I'd see him walking to where he'd go practice karate. Yeah. I'd pick him up. Sometimes I'd see him going home. It was Dozens of times I picked him up and gave him a ride. He, he's a real nice guy. Awesome. Good job, Cruz. Appreciate the call. Thanks for getting in today. He mentioned Amarillo High. Chapin came close, Adrian. They were right there down the stretch. I'm sure UTEP Zay has something to say about that. Zay, we almost had Chapin in the Final Four. Yeah, we did. And, you know, it was a great run. And Amarillo, they're a really tough team. I mean, they have size. I think they had, like, you know, well over 11 players over six foot. And they just they wear you down. You know, mm-hmm. you watch that game and you could see, you know, down the stretch, they play kind of like North Texas. You know, I told that to Adrian. They just wear you down. You know, they, they get buckets. Um, and they take a long time. They just they play basketball in such a you know fundamental way, and it was it was fun to watch that game. You know, it was back and forth for a lot of it, and towards the end, Amarillo just you know they had more in the tank. But still, what Rodney Lewis has done all these years at Chapin, he's built a powerhouse. He really has. Yeah, he has, and you know I talked about this. You know, it's not an easy job. You know, prior to Rodney Lewis getting there, UTEP struggled. Um, Chapin struggled for you yeah. know a couple of years there, more than you know five or six years without a district championship, five or six years without a by district championship. So you know, it's not an easy job. He took over. You know, not you know I'm not going to say a tough situation, but not an easy one. He instilled a good culture, and you know he's getting he, they're reaping the benefits now. I mean. You know, three straight years of, of beating El Paso teams, over 70 straight wins over El Paso teams, and Huge. just a dynasty. Let's go to uh, Adrian. He joins us next. The Sports Talk continues. Adrian, what's going on? Hey, Cap. How you doing? I'm doing well, Adrian. What's up with you? Uh, God, no, this year, coming in, listening to what you guys were talking about, about uh, the boxing and, yeah. and bringing in the UFC. That hasn't been done for a while except like with the boxing i remember when escalante was uh making 
making his uh, name out there with boxing, he would bring a lot of uh, fights to El Paso, which was great. And the people would go out there and, and watch his fights and the undercards and whatnot. And it was really fun. So we need to bring that back because El Paso is Hispanic. It's, you know, uh, we a bunch of Mexicans. And that's one of the sports that we excel in in regards to uh, globally, right? Everybody talks well about Mexican boxers and, and how they do it and how they're really good and great. Um, but the USC, after seeing Dana White going to Mexico City and having this whole thing revolve around Mexican fighters, I mean, why can't we bring that to El Paso? And maybe, I don't know if it's cliche saying the battle of the border mm-hmm. or uh, changing the name to something different, but it would be great to uh, get a bunch of Mexican UFC fighters upcoming Ones that already have their name established in the in the in the fight business and and, uh, and let them let them go and, and and show what they got. That would be so awesome, especially in the Don Haskins, fourteen thousand people out there. I think we could feel it, especially if it's a UFC fight. Well, and, I hope I hope it happens down the road. I really do. That would be fantastic. I'm with you. I'm with you on that. So let's see. So yeah, maybe we'll just, you know. Uh, yeah, 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 that's what I'm like. Uh, I'm listening to what uh, you're saying, and I'm like, that would be great if we can have that. So, all right, good job. Uh, Appreciate the phone call, Adrian. Thanks for getting in. Thirty nine past the hour. One more boxing note. This came from. Uh, did they announce Solo two yet? At make Solo the number two. George Foreman defeated Vic Scott at the El Paso Coliseum in 1971. He's right. Uh, that. Fight took place on a Tuesday night at the Coliseum. There were five. Uh, uh, there were five bouts on the card, and George Foreman was twenty-eight and zero at the time, and uh, William Victor Scott was one and two, and uh, that was one of the uh, big fights that was happening out at the Coliseum. That was the main event that night, and. Man. What, Pretty, a, what a star-studded group right there. Can you imagine? I mean, that's, uh, you know, young. You're getting George Foreman in his uh, early years as he was building up his record uh, before he was uh, winning titles. I mean, he didn't even get an opportunity to win a title until, oh, gosh, I would say maybe the following year he won the Pan American heavyweight title. And then came the Joe Frazier fight about a year and a half later for the uh, WBA and WBC heavyweights. So wild that uh, El Paso got to see George Foreman uh, as a youngster in 1971. Yeah, and as he was on his way up, right? Yep, exactly. It's not like he was uh, you know, just barely getting underway. He was on his way to stardom, and, and that's really cool that El Pasoans got a chance to see him on uh, you know, just a random thir- or Tuesday night in, in the Coliseum. That's a super cool thing right there. I hope for the best for the future of combat sports here in El Paso, whether it's UFC, boxing, um, you know, even in the WWE, just to see more events to happen here in El Paso. I have to mention Russell Russell Wilson because I promoted it twice and I haven't brought it up yet. Cut today by the Broncos. They're going to eat over $80 million in dead cap space. That's how bad they wanted to get rid of him. Guys, this was a failed experiment from the very beginning. A total disaster. And you wonder, after what's taken place, will Russell Wilson ever start again in the NFL? Yeah, that's a good question. I think he could be a bridge-the-gap quarterback for a team that's looking for a veteran and maybe looking to move on from their current guy. Uh, Minnesota Vikings, that's, to me, the best fit. They can draft a quarterback who's not in the top three group of Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, and Drake May. They maybe get a J.J. McCarthy, maybe a My- uh, Michael Penix. They get a quarterback like that and mold him into the system while uh, somebody like Russell Russell Wilson takes the starting role to start off the year. Maybe you uh, finish off the season with a younger rookie with Minnesota. That may, Minnesota makes sense. Could he possibly end up in Pittsburgh with the Steelers? Yeah, I could see that making a lot of sense, too, if they're ready to move on from Kenny Pickett. Uh, even if they want to compliment Kenny Pickett with another quarterback, we obviously know it's not Mason Rudolph. It's not Mitch Trubisky as the answer for the backup role there. All right. When we come back, final countdown. John Teicher will join us from Hudson's Grill, 1770 Lee Trevino. Get ready, folks. UTEP basketball with Keith Adams and Joe Golding is 20 minutes away right here on 600 ESPN El Paso.